Good afternoon, morning, or evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Hi, my brothers and sisters in Christ and anybody that's new to the channel. Um, I hope you all are doing well. I just wanted to get on here and just kind of share some of the things that God has been doing because God will always be good. His intentions will always be good. His plans will always be good. His ways will always be good. His ways are higher than the heavens. They're higher than ours. Hallelujah. And so he has a will and a plan for each and every one of you. Hallelujah. And if we want to find out what that will and that plan is, we need to be going to the source. But this, um, these particular two testimonies are um, going to be on the topic of unforgiveness today. So I pray that you will watch until the end. I know that the Lord is going to, to bless you because that is what he does, right? Conviction hurts, but then it heals. And um, God is so, he's so strategic in what he does. The Lord is so purposeful. So <laughs> I thought I had an appointment at the dentist's office because I saw the notification come up on my phone and they usually send it to me the same day to ask me if I want to come in early. So I just, I kind of like half looked at it and said, oh, 1130, I got to go and jumped into an Uber and headed over there and then realized when I got to the office that my appointment was not yet. Um, so I'm like, well, I'm already here, right? It's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. Let me just see, you know, where I can go. And so my plan was to go to this little place right in the middle of the city. It's not quite a park, but there's like a place where you can sit down. They have benches. And I just wanted to sit there and worship the Lord. I wasn't, I wasn't looking for anybody to talk to at that particular time. I was just worshiping, right? God had a different plan, though. So while I was worshiping, hands raised up in the air, just singing and just enjoying and basking in the glory of God. Here comes this man. He comes over and he says, hi, is, is everything all right? And I was like, yeah, everything is fine. I'm, I'm just worshiping God out here. I'm just praising the Lord. And so we end up having this, this conversation and, and it starts off with, oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure you were okay. And um, I noticed that he had a, a foot cast. So I asked him what happened to your foot. And he said, well, he said, I broke my ankle. And he's had about, I think, three surgeries. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, well, I'd really like to pray for you. Now, initially, I was going to pray for, for his ankle. Um, but then he starts talking about his, his wife and how she was diagnosed with cancer. And um, that's since been in remission. So praise the Lord for that. But then he himself was diagnosed with cancer. So he, he told me that he had been out walking his dog for about two hours. So I can imagine there were all kinds of thoughts going through his mind about, you know, the what ifs, right? Because we just start to enter into this place of what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my spouse? What happens if the both of us were sick? Who's going to take care of who we wouldn't be able to? And on all of those worries and fears um, that come with that kind of a, a bad report. So I said, well, I'd really like to, to pray for you. I'm going to pray for, for healing. So I told him, you know, Jesus Christ, I don't know what you believe, but, you know, Jesus Christ, God incarnate, God in the flesh, the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God. God walked among us as a man on the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And he died on a cross and he was buried in a rich man's grave. And he rose from the dead three days later. And the Bible says that he, he bore all of our sicknesses and he carried all our diseases. And by the 39 stripes, those 39 wounds that he received on his back for you and for me, we are healed. So we got to decree and declare that healing and just believe God for it. It's already ours. So he said, okay. So I did tell him this. I said, you know, before we start the prayer, there's one hindrance that we want to get out of the way before we start the prayer. One of the biggest hindrances to prayer is unforgiveness. And I said, now sometimes we don't even know that we have unforgiveness. Maybe 
when I say that, somebody comes to mind right away, but maybe it doesn't. And if it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that something isn't there. It just means sometimes we take the hurt and we just bury it. We just put it away somewhere and try to forget about it and act like it didn't bother us as much as it did. But that doesn't mean that the wound is not still there. It doesn't mean that that wound still doesn't need to be tended to in order to fully heal. I said, so Jesus said in the Bible, he said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. He also said that he is faithful and just to forgive the sins that we confess, right? So unforgiveness is a sin. We're commanded 70 times seven to forgive in the Bible. So he agrees, you know, to let me pray for him. And I started the prayer with saying, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to search my heart right now. Lord, if I have any unforgiveness in my heart towards anybody, any offense, any bitterness, any, any resentment, any vengeance, any retaliation, whatever it is, any anger, I release it to you right now. I give it to you right now. I'm sorry. God, forgive me for having this in my heart. Take this out of my heart give me a heart of compassion a heart of flesh a heart of gentleness a heart of mercy pour your love into my heart for the people that have hurt harmed me caused me offense whatever it is falsely accused me violated my trust betrayed me whatever it is and so he walks through this prayer with me and I, I prayed for his wife. I prayed for a covering over their marriage. I prayed that the Lord would bless their marriage. I prayed that uh, no sickness, pestilence, infirmity, or disease would be allowed to go anywhere near their home, not just their dwelling place, but their bodies either. I prayed for all sickness, pestilence, and disease within themselves, within him to go, and that it would not return for her in Jesus' mighty name. And this man, he, he hung his head for a few seconds afterwards. He was very quiet. And then he goes, I feel better. And I was like, well, praise the Lord. Because he doesn't want us carrying that. That's a weight that he never intended for us to carry. As a matter of fact, when Jesus got up on that cross willingly, it was so that part of it was so that we didn't have to carry these burdens. He gives us the option as God gives us the option as his child, lay this down. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take the weight. Just confess it. Just humble yourself and admit, yes, Lord, this is in my heart. I'm so sorry. I know this shouldn't be here. I know what I'm commanded to do. But I also know that I don't have the capacity apart from you to do anything. You said apart from me, I can't, apart from you, I can't do anything. So Jesus, I invite you in to do what I can't. So after that, I'm walking back from this little area in downtown and I was going to get a haircut. Praise God that I can. Um, so I was looking in this like small plaza where there they there was a hair salon I had never been there before and I have a place that I had normally gone to before that I knew the woman really well and I had already called and left a message but I didn't see that she called me back so I was like well maybe I could go there and I felt a firm like no in my spirit like the Lord was saying no no wait and so sure enough, you know, I, I checked and I, I saw um, uh, area code, a, a local number. And I was like, well, I don't recognize this, but, you know, maybe they called me from like their cell phone or something. Sure enough, the salon had called me that I normally go to. And initially she told me there was a 2.30 appointment open. But then she said, but I can give you something sooner if you want. So keep in mind, again, God is intentional. God is purposeful. Even that half an hour change in the appointment time was crucial. 
So just as soon as I finished my haircut, the two women in the salon who happen to be sisters sit down. And I walked over because they always have like all these little like Italian, like biscotti and snacks. I'm like, oh, what's over here? Just checking stuff out. And they said, Angela, this woman right here sitting in the chair, she really needs prayer. And I said to the woman, I said, do you need prayer? And she said, yeah. And I could see that she was carrying a heavy, heavy weight. And she goes, I do, I do. So I started talking to her and I didn't even understand <laughs> or know that her issue was unforgiveness. I just started talking to her about the hindrances that need to be removed before we pray for anything. And she said, well, she said, I can't. I can't forgive this individual. No, no. She said, actually, um, it's gotten to the point where she bottled it up, right, which is never a good thing anyway. But she bottled it up. She kept it all inside for years and years and years and just dealt with her husband's mother's animosity and cruelty. You know, the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So we know what that is. Um, if, you're, if you're a Christian, you know that our war is spiritual. And if you're not, I'm here to tell you that today. It's not your aunt, it's not your uncle, it's not your mother, it's not your father. It's the evil at work in that individual that's trying to open you up to things like offense, bitterness, anger, resentment, retaliation, whatever it is. Anger is a mighty foothold for the devil. The Bible says that the devil rolls, or he roars, prowls around like a roaring lion, sorry, seeking whom he may devour. And he's patient. So he'll watch and he'll lurk and he'll wait until he sees something that he, he knows is going to cause you offense. Maybe he knows that you don't like being ignored. Maybe he knows that you don't like condescension, that that's a trigger for you for whatever reason. The devil knows these things and he will use them against you. So our battle is not against flesh and blood. I need to make that clear. I also told this woman that as well. But it's hard, it's really hard to understand that and not get upset at the person that's in front of you when they're the one that's screaming and they're the ones that's berating you or demeaning you or degrading you or insulting you or whatever it is. It's really hard to understand in that moment that this is a really a spiritual attack that's going on and that the devil is just the enemy is has decided to use that person as his vessel for this attack for the moment so as i was talking to her and she's telling me well i just can't i just can't forgive this woman there's just no way there's just too much she's just done too much i just want i just want her out of the equation like i don't want her around i don't need to have a relationship with her and i said well i said if she's your husband's mother you kind of do need to be around her at some point in time you can't just avoid her but here's the thing i understand you know that we get hurt and the the first thing we want to do is retreat and flee and isolate ourselves and separate ourselves from that individual and avoid that person to protect ourselves from any future hurt but god's ways are not our ways so i said to her you can't you can't forgive these kind of offenses you're right but jesus can and Jesus can equip you to do it if you will only invite him into the situation to do what you can't using his capacity forgiveness for forgiveness, not your own. And so it, it took a little bit before she finally agreed um, for prayer. And the two sisters, I noticed God's hand was all over this because the two sisters was like, just let her pray for you. What, what's the problem? Just let her pray for you. What can it, what can it hurt? What are you afraid of? 
So finally she agrees and I sit down in the chair next to her. And I'm like, this is what I want you to say. Kind of along the same lines as the, the prayer that I did with that man, Mark, in uh, the park or whatever you want to call it. And so she did. She she does this. She she walks through the prayer with me. And I said, "No, you're just gonna. I release it to you. You're just gonna say, I forgive them. I I forgive the people who have hurt and harmed me. Not just her, but anybody else. And she had unforgiveness towards herself. And I'm like, release that to him. Give it to him right now. Jesus, I'm sorry for having this in my heart. Lord, forgive me. Please cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Please take this venom, this poison, out of my heart." And replace it with the fruits of your spirit. Replace it with your gentleness and your kindness and your understanding and your compassion and your patience and your love. As soon as she started saying this, she was weeping uncontrollably, crying, just wailing. And she started to sweat profusely. And she noticed that her, her, her shirt was soaked from all the sweat and the other two sisters both the sisters were crying because the Holy Spirit moved in on all three of them during this prayer it was beautiful beautiful only God only the one true living God only Jesus Christ only our Father in heaven can shift an atmosphere like that and touch everybody in the room when their prayer wasn't even meant for them they saw this woman's brokenness and when she lifted her head up she was a little embarrassed at first because you know she had had cheek streaked with mascara I said don't worry about that I said I can I can see the peace on your face and it was unmistakable both the sisters said the same thing you look so calm you look so peaceful hallelujah <laughs> So God made a divine appointment with this woman. He made sure that I didn't go to any other salon. He made sure that the sisters were involved in it so that this woman would finally accept the prayer. Because at first she was just, she was already setting herself up for failure by saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. And I told her that that's okay. You're right. You can't, you don't, you don't have the capacity, but God is more than able. To do what you can't. What you don't want to do. What you never want to do. Is hold on to that. And let it fester for years and years. Because it can cause all kinds of. And I told her about this physical pain. And illnesses. And she admitted. As we were talking. That she had all kinds of health issues. All kinds of afflictions. Popping up. Since this whole ordeal. That had been going on for years. And years and part of the reason was this the Lord gave me this word before I even started to pray for her and said that both of them had it not just the woman that I was gonna pray for but the husband's mother they were both dealing with the root of rejection so the Lord was trying to show her another perspective and trying to explain to her that the the mother had suffered deep wounds of rejection as a child so the one person that wasn't rejecting her the one person that wanted her around and wanted a relationship with her she was clinging to her son like a lifeline and she felt threatened by anybody that would try to take him away from her she felt threatened by that even though this woman is not a threat she's not a threat his mother was he she's still a part of his life but she she wants she wants all his time she doesn't want to share him with anyone and part of the reason why is this deep deeply rooted rejection a curse of rejection strongholds of rejection a spirit of rejection and now this woman was dealing with the same thing because of what the mom was doing. So rejection is generational. It goes on for four 
generations, right? So that needs to be broken in the name of Jesus. So we prayed for that first. I prayed for generational curses of rejection to break off of her. I prayed for the mother for, for her to be healed of that deep wound of rejection as well. I prayed for the mother to, um, you know, make an exchange with Jesus where he's going to take her heart of stone and give her a heart of flesh and make her see that, you know, that, that, that nobody is going to take her son away, but she also cannot expect no one else to be around or want any part of his time. That's not realistic. So I prayed for mending in their relationship. I prayed for mending in the family, for grudges to be dropped, for communication um, to be improved upon in such a way that people feel heard and understood and then she told me that her son was also battling with addiction so we prayed against that and the lord spoke something out of my mouth and i know it was a prophecy and it was so just just beautifully timed and the lord said no 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 not only am i going to save your son and pull him out of that i'm going to meet him like Jesus met Saul on the road to Damascus. It was so beautiful. And the hope, the hope that was just rising up on her, you could see it. Because Jesus is our blessed hope. He is the hope of glory. So I don't know what you're dealing with today. Maybe you have some physical ailments that you've been dealing with, some physical afflictions, some sicknesses. Maybe you've been into the doctors. Maybe they can't figure out what's going on. Maybe you're just having these like trial run after trial run trying to figure out what is the cause of this pain? What is the cause of this sickness? A lot. Nine times out of ten, it's spiritual. Nine times out of ten, it's spiritual. And it's generational. A lot of times it's generational illness. Now, it may not be the same for everybody, but infirmity might be a curse that runs through the bloodline. So that needs to be broken. But one of the things that gives the enemy legal right and permission to mess with a family is unforgiveness. It's an open door. It's an open door. And so it, unforgiveness in our hearts, like when we let it go, that's not a one-time thing. In this walk, you're going to be doing that consistently. King David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me daily. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me into the way everlasting. And when you ask God if there's any wicked way in you, you can be rest assured. He's going to show you where your weaknesses lie. He's going to put people in front of you that push all those buttons until something comes out and you're like, what was that? But God does it graciously. He's not doing it to punish you. Yes, it might be a form of chastisement in the moment, but God chastises those he loves. He's not doing it to punish you. He's doing it to show you something about yourself to say, now is the time that we're going to deal with this thing right here. Maybe you didn't even know it was an issue until he brought it up. So unforgiveness has many forms, but it starts with offense. Unforgiveness starts with a simple offense. But it's not so simple because unchecked offense ends up bec becoming bitterness. Bitterness hardens the heart. The Bible talks about the heart being like a stone. Bitterness hardens the heart like a stone. It takes that heart of flesh and brings it right back to a heart like a rock. Until that bitterness leaves. Bitterness left unchecked becomes apathy. Apathy is when you just have no excitement, no passion, no joy about nothing, right? You're just kind of going through the day. You're going through the motions and 
you're not really moved by anything. And that includes the things of God. So apathy makes us apathetic, not only towards life in general and finding no happiness, no joy in it, but also being apathetic towards the things of God. And people will start saying things like this. Well, I, I went to church today and when they were singing worship, I just, they, they just weren't being moved by the music. It just wasn't, it, it wasn't making them feel the way that it, it usually does. They weren't even excited about it. They didn't even want to sing along. Or apathy, another thing uh, that happens is you'll get in your Bible. In the Bible, there's alive and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. The Bible that, you know, you used to be able to commune with your father in heaven. He was, he speaks to us through the word. All of a sudden they would say things like, well, I don't know. I was, I was reading my Bible and, um, it's like, it's like, it's, it's stale to me. It's, it's, it's boring all of a sudden. So they would say that the Bible was beginning to become boring and they weren't getting revelation like they used to. And it wasn't even making sense. And they were just thinking about all the other things that they'd rather be doing than meditating on the word. That's a problem. And that's God's grace. When you start to feel like that, it's God's grace warning you there's a problem. The next thing is anger. Anger is a mighty foothold for the devil. We don't want to give the devil a leg up, not just into our life, but into our household, into our marriage, into our families, coming after children. We don't we don't want to give him an all access pass because we're not willing to let things go or check our heart on a daily basis to make sure and it goes a little something like this, Lord, is there any legal right? Lord, is there any legal right? Is there something here? And maybe you already know it's there. Confess it. He's faithful and just to confess, to forgive the sins that we confess. He's faithful and just to forgive. We just have to humble ourselves and say, Lord, this is here. I'm sorry that I let this get in. I'm sorry that... Um, I got I got offended, which is an indicator of some level of pride, which is something that we all have to battle against daily. Right? Pride causes offense. And offense causes all the other things that were just mentioned. So I mean we, we we've gotta attack the enemy with the word, right? Attack him with the word. Guard your heart. Put the armor of God on. I put it on in the morning. As soon as I wake up. And right before I go to bed. The armor of God from Ephesians 6. The helmet of salvation. That pr protects your, your head, your mind, your thought life. Because the enemy is going to come up for that a lot. The next one is the shield of faith. The shield of faith. It quenches every fiery dart that the evil one, the adversary, the devil tries to throw at you throughout the day. If you have doubt and unbelief, then the enemy, when he shoots an arrow, he can get at you. So that's another thing that needs to be renounced and checked daily. Lord, am I being doubtful? And you can usually tell if you're just paying attention to what's going through your mind. Worry is doubt and unbelief. Anxiety, fear is doubt and unbelief. Discouragement. Hopelessness. Doubt and unbelief. It's all rooted in that. So just say, Lord, am I not believing you? Am I not trusting in you? I want to trust in, in you. Show me how to trust in you more. Stretch my faith, grow my faith, however you have to. Yeah, it might not be comfortable how he chooses to stretch and grow your faith. But that's something we all need is greater faith. 
The Bible says faith the size of a mustard seed is all that's needed. A tiny seed. And you can say to any obstacle in your path, move aside and be cast into the sea. And it has to go in order for the Lord's will to be done. Any obstruction, any hindrance, any blockage, any opposition, move aside and be cast into the sea. But faith is required for that. The next biggest hindrance to anybody's prayers is a faithless prayer is going to nine times out of ten is going to go unanswered because God is not moved by faithlessness. God is not moved by doubt and unbelief. God is moved by our faith. God is moved when we get in there and say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know where it's going to come from. I don't even know how you're going to get me where you said you're going to put me. But I trust you. I choose to trust you. I choose to believe you no matter what I can see. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And that's what God wants from you. He wants you to take a look at the situation, not see any likelihood or possibility that that could turn out the way that you are ex expecting or anticipating it would or how he said it would. And just trust that he's going to get you through. He might not do it the way you're expecting. You might even think you have a better plan than God. Please don't. When we think we have a better plan than God, we need to humble ourselves and quickly. Because God knows the end from the beginning. We don't even know what's going to happen in the next five minutes from now. I pray that this blessed somebody today. I hope it, it finds you well. Uh, I just want to let each and every one of you know that I love you. Um, I will try to go through the comments. There's been a lot going on lately, but um, things are slowing down just a little bit. So I want to be able to go through the comments and answer the rest of those prayer requests um, over the next few days. But I love you all. Um, continue to email me as well. If you want prayer, my email address is aambrose2010 at gmail.com. God bless.